we're going to talk about the bioeconomy. So zooming out and not thinking about the details of molecules, but how this manifests in economic practice and relationships. Let's jump in. Um, economy, what's that? Well, you could say it's the wealth or resources of a region, or more particularly, the making of things, the consumption of things, the goods and services. And so when we put bio in front of economy, it's how does bio making and bio consumption relate to the goods and services we enjoy or depend upon. In the modern sense, the thinking here is not that old. Um, here's a paper that was published in 2007 by Rob Carlson. Rob used to be my old housemate, believe it or not. Um, he writes, laying the foundations for a bioeconomy. And in the abstract, we see he says, biotech is becoming an important part of the economy. Now, biotech, of course, gets invented around 1980. And so when he writes in 2007, this is 27 years in, maybe 30 years in. And within a generation after the invention of genetic engineering, biotech is contributing 1% to the gross domestic product, this proxy for all economic activity in the United States. So 1% of everything, right? 1% um, including finance revenue and, and manufacturing revenue of cars and like biotech's already 1%, this back in 2007. And what's interesting is he's like, it's growing. It's growing fast, 20% growth. Um, that's incredible growth, right? It's like doubling in, in just a few years. If you grow 20% every year, suddenly you've got twice as much. All right, what else does Rob say? Oh, I love this, this is fun language. He writes, welcome to the paleobiotic age. Just as today we look back somewhat wistfully on our quaint paleolithic, literally old stone ancestors, our, our descendants, the people who come after us, they're gonna see us as the, the paleobiotic people, you know, that we, we hardly understood biology and biotechnology at all. Um, it's only 1% of the economy. You know, maybe it's gonna become 90% of the economy. Um, we're paleobiotic people. Um, I love that word. And, you know, what is the bioeconomy? How big is it? And he estimates it's somewhere between 350 to a trillion dollars a year um, and so on. All right. And if you go back in time to 2007, one of the reasons Rob's framing and paper were so important is it helped displace recent earlier experiences. So this image here shows an effort to decontaminate it looks like the Congress in Washington, D.C., in response to Amerithrax, the sending of anthrax spores as a pathogen to members of Congress and others. And there are about 24 casualties uh, due to these very famous attacks that immediately followed the planes um, uh, being hijacked. Um, what do I mean? More specifically, the way people thought about biotechnology following the anthrax attacks Culturally, the narrative was dominated by fear and bioterror. And so when Rob shows up with others, as we'll see, and starts talking about the bioeconomy, people are like, oh, thank goodness. Like, we might want economic growth. We might want jobs and money, right? And so might bioeconomy be culturally more powerful than bioterror? It turns out it was. And so another incredibly important piece of work was led by Mary Maxson, working in the Obama White House, She's a biologist, a geneticist who had studied yeast previously, but then enters public service and working in the Obama White House drafts, leads the drafting of what was then called the National Bioeconomy Blueprint. And, um, you know, goes on to write things like a bioeconomy is one based on the use of research and innovation and the biological sciences to create economic activity and public benefit. Um, the bioeconomy is all around us new drugs, new diagnostics for improved health, higher uh, yielding food crops, better biofuels that reduce dependency on petroleum, and so on, just to name a few, they write. And the public benefit gained here is enormous. It's feeling pretty good. This is 11 years ago. But there's a problem, and it was a, it was a political cultural problem. Although the White House is drafting a bioeconomy blueprint, we weren't able to put into practice um, executive orders or legislation to dramatically advance 
the blueprint. Um, instead, what we encountered was concerns about biotechnology, concerns about GMOs, valid concerns. And, and so in other words, instead of boosting the bioeconomy back in 2012, we got a little bit of a, a pushback and, and people concerned about the environment and organic food and so on um, appropriately raised questions about what future we might be building with our bioeconomy. And so we didn't see um, uh, actions taken at the highest levels of government uh, just just a, over a decade ago. Rob appears um, not too much later, 2016, and he's um, estimating uh, this time, like how big is the bioeconomy really and how much is it growing? And it's like, okay, we've got industrial stuff. These are polymers and monomers, things that make carpets, you know, by brewing uh, ingredients. We've got biologics, which is a placeholder for medicines and then crops, right? And you can see these sectors in 1980, there's zero uh, billion dollars a year of revenue and, and genetic engineering is just getting going and then up, 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 up and away, right? And it's, you know, doubling with interesting pacing every five years or so. Um, okay. And, and so, you know, like, again, why are we talking about bioeconomy? Well, if you're becoming a bionaut and, and are going to be doing things in the world, whether you're doing making goods or services, you're, you're going to be entering into the bioeconomy directly or indirectly. So we might want to understand it, right? That's just like to remind us what the motivation is here. Um, here's another cut at what Rob's representing. Um, it's interesting. The biggest economic sector for biotechnology back in 2017 is food, agriculture. And the second biggest is industrial intermediates. And medicines and health, which is what people think about uh, first, most of the time, it's actually a big sector, but it's the third biggest, right? So that's that's interesting to see. Uh, okay, and this is just for the United States, right? So globally, it's going to be bigger still. So uh, let's see what's happening again. Like, let's try again at the White House. So here we are in 2019 um, with the the White House then, uh, Dr. Megan Palmer, Dr. Mark Sallet, and myself. And we're there for the 2019 summit on America's bioeconomy. Um, and you can see a description here, the link down below. You can read the whole report. Bioeconomy represents the infrastructure, innovation, products, technology, and data derived from biologically related processes and science that drive economic growth, improve public health, agriculture, and security. Bio bioeconomy outputs are incredibly diverse and feature applications limitless in terms of application and value new ways to treat cancer, novel manufacturing methods for medicines, plastics, materials, consumer products, pests and disease, and so on and so on. DNA-based information storage. Well, wow, all the things we've been talking about in class. Looks like they got it right. Um, now it's 2% of the GDP, almost $400 billion a year. We weren't able, just in 2019, um, to get an executive order signed by the president. We didn't see at the highest levels of government just like in 2012, we were close. We were close again, but no deal. Um, but what if we really could grow almost anything? And so, well, we didn't yet see the government going all in on biotechnology and bioengineering and the bioeconomy. We saw the private sector start to pick up on this even more. And so here's a report from McKinsey, the consulting shop, Right, and they dropped this in 2020 or thereabouts. The bio revolution. There's going to be four areas for innovation: molecular systems, bio machines, and biocomputing. And the scope of the impact of innovation in these fundamental research layers is ridiculous. 60% um, of the physical stuff we need and consume in our society could be grown, as opposed to refined and derived from fossil inputs or other manufacturing methods. Um, we foresee addressing almost half of the world's diseases through a bio-revolution. And this is talking about the next 10, 20 years. And, um, you know, there's a lot of R&D opportunity. What are they talking about in a little bit more detail? Biomaterial production, personalized precision services and medicines, engineered organisms, higher productivity, 
biomachine interfaces and computing. It's going to impact agriculture, health, energy, consumers. Um, instead of being, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars a year domestically, it's going to be two to four trillion dollars a year. It's a double digit percentage of the economy. Um, it's growing, right? We're, we're not just growing in terms of what we do with biology, but the economic impact of bioengineering is growing. And, and not only are there like transformational capacities across many different application areas, there's a lot of problems. There are a lot of risks, things to manage. It could be misused. It's hard to get agreement. There's privacy concerns. It might not be fairly distributed. Not everybody could benefit from the bioeconomy. Um, you might not be able to control it in terms of crossing borders and policing. Right, so you can look at that the right side and probably add other concerns. I just want you to know that all these risks are opportunities for somebody to figure out how to mitigate the risk or solve the problem. Right, so there's tremendous growth in opportunity and support for the bioeconomy. Of course, now we're also experiencing a pandemic, right? And so the SARS-CoV-2 experience is informing everybody's thinking. Uh, the private sector continues to grow. Here's some students who took over the New York Stock Exchange for a day and it looks like they put a T-Rex on the front. And uh, below that, as they're listing their company on the stock exchange, they say, grow everything, right? So they're gonna give that a try. Finally, in September of 2022, we see an executive order signed by the president of the United States of America. And let's just read it a little bit. Um, executive order on advancing biotechnology and biomanufacturing innovation for a sustainable, safe, and secure American bioeconomy. And one of the lead uh, 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 public servants who helped get this across the finish line is Dr. Michelle Rozo. Here, Megan Palmer, uh, past colleague, uh, was, was, was part of the event as well. And so, you know, like the executive order mechanism is interesting because it's literally the president ordering the executive branch of the government to do stuff, right? And so they're fun to read. It's like, by the authority vested in me as president, uh, I order the following, right? Section one, policy. It's the policy of my administration to co coordinate a whole of government approach to advance biotech, biomanufacturing towards innovations, innovative solutions and in all the things we've been talking about in this class. Health, climate, energy, food security, agriculture, supply chains, national and economic security. Central to this policy and its outcomes are the principles of fairness, doing the right thing, safety and security. All right. And, and again, the link if you want to read the whole thing and like see what's going on is at the bottom of the slide. Finally, right? Like finally, we see at the highest level of government, like bioeconomy is going to matter, which is proxy for jobs and money derived from bioengineering, biotechnology. It only took us four administrations, uh, but here we are, right? And so, you know, uh, what does this look like? You can track down on YouTube, the recording of the event, I drop some links in here, like check it out. I, I double dog dare you to go to the second link at the timestamp, 15 minutes, and listen to what the director of the National Science Foundation has to say about bioengineering, right? But this is the room and you've got the science advisor to the president, the chair of the National Economic Council, the National Security Advisor, Chairman Warner from the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, you know, the, anyway like all of government approach, like we're going to figure this out, right? Okay. And so the rest of the world starts to react. Here's John Cumbers writing for Forbes. White House unveils strategy to grow trillion dollar U.S. bioeconomy. The bioeconomy is booming and it's going to get a lot bigger. And let's go, right? And it um, looks like he used um, uh, DALI uh, and artificial intelligence to make a, a pseudo watercolor painting of what the bioeconomy looks like let you decide what you think of that artwork. Also on this article is pretty interesting. Dragon Lady has a comment that she drops at the bottom. Nice article. The one thing that's going to be a problem with this plan is that our education system isn't educating the future generations to think, to innovate, to create, to push the envelope and to develop new technologies that are safe and sustainable. Ha ha, but here you are, right? So Dragon Lady doesn't know about you and what we're doing through this class together. I love this comment, we're on it, right? So, so remember when you become a bionaut, maybe you can pay it forward and teach still more people about what biotechnology is about and why they might wanna be part of it or at least express how they feel about it. 
okay, fine. It's great at a high level, but it's like White House this and that. At this point, you should be thinking, <laughs> what about me? Right? Like, what do 21st century bioengineers do? Are, and it's like, are there really jobs? And, and like, what are they? And is there a job for me? Right? So these are all the more important questions, right? Because we're all just individuals, yeah. and we've got to figure this out for ourselves. Stop. Almost done. Our course has this theme of enabling you to become a bionaut, navigating and leading into the biotechnology frontier and beyond, right? Like an astronaut going into space, but much more interesting, we're going into the future of biotechnology together, right? So bionauts assemble. Um, what we wanted to do is talk to people in the real world and ask them what type of bioengineers they are. And so just for this class, with the team here, we have arranged for nine people to be interviewed, the folks shown here. And we've asked each of them about things like, well, what type of bioengineer are you? And how did you find your way into the biotic future as a bionaut? Let me tell you just a little bit about some of these people. But as of today, the recordings of the interviews are all online on YouTube. and. As part of the PSET, we'll ask you to at least dig into three of them to see what you can learn. So let me just give you some postcards to help you get oriented and motivate why you want to track down these interviews. First, Sophia. She is the co-founder and chief of culture for a company called Microworks. She used to be a dancer, an artist, a performer. But now she's a leader of this company called Microworks. Myco for mushrooms. And so you can see a picture here um, with her CEO. And the New York Times is asking the question, are mushrooms the future of leather? And what Microworks does is they use mushrooms that grow on wood chips to make a mushroom skin that you can peel off and put through a tanning process and make a replacement for animal leather. So what if you could grow a replacement for leather in a couple weeks with no cows involved, right? And you can see this picture down in the bottom left. Karma. There's Sophia in the middle in red. And they're down in Union County, South Carolina, creating a, a, a new factory, a million square foot factory that's going to provide 400 jobs in that community to scale up the manufacturing of mycological leather. Right. So maybe you want to check out the interview with she was a performer, a dancer. Now she's the chief of culture for Microworks. Another person, Ben Novick lead scientist and program manager at Revive and Restore. Revive and Restore is a charity whose mission is to bring bioengineering technologies to every other species besides Homo sapiens. There's so many people working on human health. What about the health of other creatures on the planet? And so one of the projects Ben leads, believe it or not, is to work on de-extincting or reviving the passenger pigeon, one of the most abundant birds in the history of North America it went extinct about a century ago from overhunting and loss of habitat. Could we bring that back to life and responsibly release it into the wild? That's what Ben does. So maybe you want to listen to Ben's interview. Um, how about Ahmed? Ahmed Best, amazing friend and teacher for me. He's an actor, he's a storyteller, he's an Afro-futurist. What do I mean? Um, well, he was uh, uh, played a character in Star Wars. Um, or if you watch The Mandalorian, um, he came back as a master Jedi. And I don't want to, like, spoiler alert, well, he, like, saved Baby Grogu. Um, or with his colleague, Dr. Lonnie Brooks from Cal State East Bay, runs a program called Afro Rhythms, Afro Rhythms from the Future, about democratizing the future through storytelling um, with respect to diversity of cultures. What type of bioengineer is Ahmed? Right? Maybe you should check that one out. How about Carrie McInter, special agent for the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and emergency trauma nurse. What type of bioengineer is Carrie? Well, she thinks about economic espionage, um, nation states spying on each other, companies spying on each other, uh, bioengineering innovations in the United States. Are they safe and secure to benefit Americans and others? Or what if bioengineering technologies could be misused to create more bioterror? How are we going to deal with counterproliferation and biosecurity? Um, 
and other matters involving people and keeping people safe, right? Trafficking and, and so on, right? Check out her interview. Or Tia Lyles Williams, founder and CEO of Lucas Pie Bio. Lucas and Pi are the names of her uh, grandmothers combined into one name. She named her company after her grandmothers, um, as I understand it. And at Lucas Pi Bio, which is based in Philadelphia or just outside Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, their mission is to make the manufacturing of biotherapies more affordable while growing the bioeconomy and strengthening healthcare offerings within underserved communities. Um, you can see a sketch of the manufacturing facility her team is, is developing and operating in Pennsylvania. Check out what, what they have to say. Um, another example, Barbara Jankosa. She's a biotech professor and program director at Mira Costa College, a community college in Northern San Diego in California. And so the college runs a biomanufacturing program where people can learn how to help with biomanufacturing. There's a lot of good jobs in a growing economy around manufacturing, and if bio economy based manufacturing is growing, there'll be more jobs there. Um, not only are there jobs in biomanufacturing, but there's jobs in teaching people about biomanufacturing, right? So maybe your biotic future as you're learning about bioengineering is to help other people learn about bioengineering. One of the things I wanted to do in selecting just a subset of these Bionaut interviews to highlight them is to give you uh, uh, like what you might be surprised by a vastly increased uh, diversity of, of bioengineering futures, right? It's not just the nerdy stuff with the making of molecules and the designing of the cells. It's all the other stuff that a society needs to have a rich and vibrant bioeconomy, right? The storytelling, the law enforcement, the education, and so on, right? It's also very interesting to see who can become a leader of a bioengineering operation, like Sophia's story as a performer and artist suddenly becoming an executive in a mushroom manufacturing company. There's no shortage of needs or opportunities, in other words. And I want to challenge you to think about this forever, frankly, by just giving you one more postcard. This is what are known as the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Things that we would like collectively to see made real so that the world would be better. Like, let's get rid of poverty. Let's get rid of hunger. Let's make sure everybody has good health and well-being. Everybody has the option of accessing a quality education, that there's gender equality, that there's clean water and sanitation for all, affordable, and so on and so forth. Right? There's 17 different goals here. Each of these goals is full of opportunities for bioengineers and bionauts. And so as a challenge, like take a look at these 17 and see if you can just sketch out a bioengineering idea or a bioeconomy opportunity that might, if developed, help realize one of these goals. It's a lot, but it means there's a lot of opportunity. It also means that most of what bioengineers could do hasn't been imagined yet. And so sometimes, if not most of the time, yeah, you could find a job posting and apply for a job, but even more powerful is to invent the job once you understand what bioengineering can do that nobody else has understood before. You just get to invent your job. And suddenly you're writing job postings for other people once you figure that out. The last part of this lecture is a warning. Not to be dramatic, but it's really interesting to understand both the power and limitation of economic thinking. And so this is a type of friendly warning and I'm so excited to share these next three slides with you um, because it's just profoundly interesting to stop and think about what the limits of economic thinking are and what lessons we can take from the recent past that might inform each of us and all of us together to shape the bioeconomy we really want. Right? So first, beware the label of economy, right? Here's an interesting New York Times story from 1999. See what's going on there, right? And one of the articles is titled Computer Age Gains Respect of Economists. 1999, right? For years, even as the computer revolutionized the workplace, productivity 
as measured by output, stagnated, barely advancing 1% a year. So it's easy to see why economists didn't care very much about computers. You got to be kidding me. It's 1999. <laughs> you know, like I was building computer models of virus infection for my PhD thesis and shipping that. I graduated with my PhD in 1998. Like, like a year later, finally, like computers gained respect of economists. Right. So, so like so much interesting stuff was happening in reality well before the economic impact of computing was manifesting. Right. Another thing to, to note is when you adopt an economic narrative, a lot of people then manage for incrementalism, like, oh, let's grow the economy 1% or 4%. You know, like not very much is going to change. It's just going to get a little bit bigger. Imagine going back in time 50 years to 1973. And it's like, we're going to grow the information economy. We need more mainframe computers. We need 4% more IBM. Like nothing against IBM, but that's not what it's all about. It's going to be about uh, the ARPANET becoming the internet and the personal computer, like qualitative disruptive opportunity, right? So like, don't, don't let economy become proxy for reality because it's going to favor incremental thinking. Second warning. Don't let the economy become a proxy for society. I love this example. John Maynard Keynes, probably the top economist in the United Kingdom in the, the 20th century. So he writes this very interesting essay, uh, 1930, right? Uh, 93 years ago. The economic possibilities for our grandchildren. Now, what's going on in 1930? From history, you remember this is the Great Depression. And so, he opens his essay by saying, in the middle of the Great Depression, we are suffering just now from a bad attack of economic pessimism. Well, that's funny language for the Great Depression, right? Um, anyway, he then goes on to say immediately, I believe it's widely mistaken interpretation that the economy is crashing and burning all the way down, right? We're suffering, he writes, not from the rheumatics of old age, from arthritis, but from growing pains of over rapid change um, and the painfulness of adjustment from one economic period to the next. Um, he goes on to write, right, like in the middle of the depression, he, he goes on to write what he imagines life will be like in a hundred years for the grandkids. That's you and me, like we're the grandkids. And, and so he says over the long term, the economy is going to grow. The structural transformations undergirding economic growth are profound. I'm so confident in this, I'm willing to predict a century of economic growth. So the economy is going to be four to eight times as high as it is today compared to 1930. Um, we're going to solve the economic problem. In other words, he writes, we're going to have so much money that nobody's going to have to worry about money. Bold, 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 bold bet, John. Um, well, he makes a mistake, and the mistake he makes is he underestimates the economic growth we actually got. Today, we actually have more money than Keynes predicted, as I understand it. But wait, you might say, if that's true, um, is it also the case that nobody has to worry about money? No, right? Um, there is plenty of money for everybody, but not everybody has plenty of money. So something was missing, in other words, from the argument that Keynes was putting forward, at least in terms of the implementation of what followed. We did get the economic growth, but we didn't get a society in which everybody has plenty of money. Hmm. Don't let economy become a proxy for society, in other words. Make sure we're getting the economy we want as you are bio -nots, and the economy becomes a bioeconomy. Okay, last one, and this one's fun and strange and even more esoteric. I love Internet. Maynard. Why did the Soviet Union fail to build a national computer network? I told you it's going to be esoteric, but hang on. People knew in the 1960s that <clears throat> networking and information technology is going to become important. And so there was a decision to make in the 1970s about what to do. And different governments made different decisions. In the United Kingdom, the British government didn't want to invest in basic research anymore, said they'd already figured out networking, as was 
proven in the labs in the 1960s. And they wanted to go right to commercialization and economic growth, like grow the economy right now with the tools of the 1960s. And so they missed out on packet switching networking or TCP IP and, and tried to translate too early. In the United States, we figured out packet switching networking and through public funding built out the early form of the internet known as the ARPANET. And we did this through uh, uh, you know, public investment uh, and with the backing of the, the Defense Department and then basically gave away those technologies to industry so that the civilian sector could build out the full internet, which we understand today, which is letting us have this class operating as it is. Okay, sounds pretty good. Like a little bit of public support in the right next-gen tech unleashed huge qualitative infrastructure improvements and structural transformation of all of our civilization through the internet. The Soviet Union is interesting. They understood the power of the network. Their motivation was economic growth. You can hear the leaders of the Soviet Union at the time brag about how they're going to bury the West in economic growth, the shouting and, and claiming at the United Nations. And the way they're going to do this is to have um, computers control and optimize how the economy is operating. And sounds pretty good, except the people in the Soviet Union who had responsibility and therefore power for different sectors of the economy didn't want to give up their power, their political power, and standing to the computers. And so they sabotaged the technology and therefore failed to get a national computer network. So the lesson here is if you motivate something only through the lens of economic growth, you might ironically fail to get the full power of the technology implemented. That's the internet internet example. Um, if you motivate something only through economic growth, you might not get equity or fairness. That's the Keynesian example. And if you motivate something through economic growth, you might not appreciate the qualitatively new disruptive opportunity, right? Um, so beware, even though the economic framing is powerful and transcending fear and unlocking tremendous opportunity for jobs and money and innovation, you can't let it be the only thing driving the bus when you build your biotic future. So let's reflect really quick. What ultimately limits the bioeconomy? Like why is McKinsey saying it's only 4 trillion a year? Why isn't it 40? How should the 21st century bioeconomy be different from the 12th century bioeconomy? Like the, the economy used to be 100% biological before we had any technology by definition. Right? So, so we wanna make sure if we're building a bioeconomy, it's progressive and future facing. How are, we gonna, how are we gonna figure that out and make sure that happens? Um, obviously, there's a lot of economic opportunity already, uh, but compared to what it's gonna be, what would you guess is the percentage of jobs in bioengineering that haven't yet been invented? That the job postings that nobody's written yet? I would guess it's at least half, maybe 90% hasn't been imagined yet. But what do you think? Could you invent a new job type in response to one of the UN's sustainability development goals? Speaking of a new job, like pick one of the 17 and, and invent a job. You might be inventing the job for yourself or your friend or your cousin. And then finally, why is it important? Like beware economic thinking as powerful as it is. Why is it important if not essential to not only think about things through the lens of economy? Yeah, this guy's great. Uh, Professor Drew Endy.